Hello, welcome to Chapter 3 Podcast, the show for readers of science fiction, fantasy, and romance. This is Season 1, Episode 16. I'm Bethany, your host, and today I'm joined by YouTuber Liana from Liana's Library to discuss the series that fantasy readers love to hate, the Sort of Truth series by Terry Goodkind. If you want to support the podcast and get early access to episodes and exciting bonus content from all of our guests, check out our Patreon linked in the show notes. And as an added bonus right now, anyone who joins as a patron at the Trope Fiend level and above between now and May 1st will receive a custom Chapter 3 podcast logo sticker and a mystery book in the mail. So that's exciting. And a big thank you to all of our patrons with a special shout out to our world expanding patron, Trina. Your support makes this possible. Before our conversation today, it's time for On My Radar, where I share recent or upcoming book releases in science fiction, fantasy, and romance that I'm excited about, and then our guest will have the opportunity to share one as well. The books for today's episode will be released between April 28th and May 11th, 2021, with the exception of the guest recommendation, which may include any upcoming release. First, on April 29th, Ariadne by Jennifer Saint is coming out. This one is a retelling of the myth of Ariadne that is perfect for fans of Circe by Madeline Miller. It centers the experience of women in Greek mythology, and it is both thought-provoking and deeply moving. I really loved it. I'm excited it's finally coming out. Then on May 4th, we have Sorrowland by Rivers Solomon. This one is a blend of fantasy and horror following a pregnant woman who escapes from a strict religious compound and gives birth to twins in the woods. But she's still a hunted woman and her body undergoes inexplicable changes. Sounds really intriguing. Then we've got uh, three books coming out May 11th. First up, A Master of Gin by P. Jelly Clark is a murder mystery that meets fantasy in an alternate history steampunk Cairo filled with gin and other supernatural entities. Very excited for this. It's his first full-length book. Then Son of the Storm by Sui Davies Okunbawa, Okunbawa is the first in an epic fantasy series called A Sweeping Tale of Violent Conquest and Forbidden Magic set in a world inspired by the pre-colonial empires of West Africa. I cannot get over how gorgeous this cover is also. Lastly, Cool for the Summer by Dahlia Adler is a YA rom-com that follows a bisexual girl caught in a love triangle between a girl and a boy, and it looks very, very cute. So go check all of those out. They're coming out soon. And with that said, please join me in welcoming Liana to the show. Thank you for joining me. Hi, thank you for having me. I know you've been on here before, but if you want to briefly introduce yourself to our listeners who haven't caught you before and share your pick for an exciting upcoming release. Sure. I'd like to introduce myself as the booktuber you should know <laughs> because you should have listened to the <laughs> podcast episodes that I'm in. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, well, I was just thinking I was on before to talk about Way of Kings, which is a series that people love that I hate. And I'm back to talk about The Sword of Truth, which is a series that I love and everyone else hates. <laughs> Balance things out, you know? So, do you need more of an intro to who I am beyond that? <laughs> no, I think that's that's probably adequate. <laughs> Um, well, my recommendation, well, I guess, is it a recommendation? Because it's an upcoming release. So I haven't read this, but mm -hmm. I'm excited. And I've pre-ordered The Black Tongue Thief by Christopher Buellman. Um, basically, I mean, it has a long synopsis, which involves a lot of magic sounding words. But basically, it's about student debt and a grimdark fantasy handling student what? debt. <laughs> what? Because <laughs> yeah, uh, he was trained by the Takers Guild and he owes them a lot in exchange for like what he learned from the takers guild so to get out from under that debt he's like doing a lot of criminal things um and he gets in oh a lot of gosh. trouble so it's basically student debt <laughs> that's that is pretty amazing actually so, yeah uh, it comes out may 25th so i'm pretty pumped for that awesome Cool. Go check it out. Okay. Well, with that said, we're here to talk about the sort of truth series and liana you and i have talked individually like, like off the show about this quite a bit before but I thought it would be worth doing a whole episode about the series because I feel like people kind of love to hate this and I got in on some level I get why because it's not perfect the author was interesting and I think <laughs> we can get into all of this but um I don't know like maybe a good place to start is why do people like to hate on the Sword of Truth series? And I guess, what is it? What is the series for anybody who doesn't know? Well, the Sword of Truth series, if you ask readers of it, it is a fantasy series. If you asked Terry Goodkind what it is, he would tell you that it is a ponderous, like, 
philosophical exercise in like extrapolating <laughs> worldviews from an allegorical, you know, blah, 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 which is why people like to hate it. I think that answers yeah. that question. <laughs> I mean, yeah, basically. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think people who enjoy it, I'm not, I can't say that there isn't anyone that was like picking up what Terry down, what Terry Goodkind was throwing down in terms of like, mm-hmm. yes, this is some, this is deep. Um, but I think the majority of people who are reading it are reading it for like fantasy adventure fun, not for like, oh man, this man has like really, you know, philosophy here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I certainly read them for fantasy adventure fun. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I and and I think that's true. I think the fact that uh, the author didn't want his books to be considered fantasy, thought they were sort of high philosophy and art, <laughs> which they are not. Yeah, yeah, no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he does occasionally go off on his uh, his little soapboxes in these very lengthy books. Yeah, for sure. But then at the same time, I would say that like a lot of authors do that. It's just most authors don't say that their books are not books at all, that you are supposed to be only there for the soapbox. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's that is definitely true. So I feel like these books get a lot of hate. And I think part of it, yes, is the author. Part of it is because he elevated his books to this level people can look at it and say okay what you actually have is you know pretty typical non-complicated fantasy adventure stories with very straightforward prose which makes them accessible but I I guess easy to make fun of which which I I mean I was gonna say what's (laughs) hilarious about it too is that like people who like either because they're ignorant of that or when they're choosing not to address like Terry Goodkind's own kind of like position on what his books are supposed to be, like ignoring and setting that aside. Um, critics of just the stories themselves, I think would often um, cite how tropey it is, how derivative mm-hmm. it is, how cliche it is in terms of just going down a checklist of what a fantasy book, like a cookie cutter fantasy book <laughs> is supposed to have. And it just makes it extra hysterical that a book that is accused more than any other of having just the most basic, like straight up fantasy cliches is has an author saying, this is not even fantasy. And you're like, there's a dragon on the cover, sir. <laughs> yeah I mean you can't get much more fantasy than these books I feel like okay so you and I both have kind of a long history with the series we and and we can talk about I think I think this would be something to talk about is what your background is I know for me I first was introduced to these books many many years ago when I was like 16 or so around around 16 and they, I loved them at the time, although also growing up in a conservative kind of evangelical family, they were very scandalous. <laughs> for, I mean, in fairness, me the they are just straight up pretty scandalous. Like, outside. I mean, they are. They're, they're <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> we've reread a couple of them. We read one a couple years ago, and then we just reread Stone of Tears, which is book two in preparation for this episode. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, there's a lot of sex in these books. So, mm-hmm. at, you know, as a 16-year-old, that was very scandalous. Well, I mean, in fairness, the violence is also quite graphic, not just true. the sex. Yeah. <laughs> that is, yeah, that's definitely true. I I was probably less scandalized by that, though. Which <laughs> <So. laughs> is, like, we could have a whole other conversation about how, I mean, like, the movie rating system has made us be like, blood and violence, PG-13. There's a tit. Yeah. Oh, that's R-rated. <laughs> like, why, mm-hmm. though? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, that is absolutely fair. But I think... It's interesting revisiting these now. Um, I'm going to let you talk about kind of your experience with these. But the first (laughs) book came out, I don't know, book two was 1995. So what, 93, 94, something like that? Presumably. I would have to check. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So just to give everybody kind of a time frame reference for when these books were com- beginning to come out. It's interesting to so think what of is it your... as being the 90s because that's when Witcher was being written. And I think about how like how much oh, like interesting. sexy stuff slash also graphic violence there is in the Witcher books. And I'm like, <laughs> but people are fine with it over there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, because right, he knew he was writing fantasy. Although I would, okay, this is not what we're here to talk about, but I would argue that by the end of the Witcher series, I was like, sir, what even is any of this about? Like, are you sure? <laughs> like, where have we gone to now? <laughs> what is this? I have not finished the series yet, so I can't even, 
comments. It, on it this, does a lot know. of navel gazing as well. <laughs> okay. Okay. So when did you first encounter the series? How far did you get? I think my last one was Pillars of Creation. I think that's as far as I got back um, in the day. I read one past that. I read Naked Empire, which is the one right okay. after that. And then I stopped. Okay. Which, is that eight or nine? I don't know. It's such a long <laughs> it's, it's It's up there. I read a few. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I maybe read Naked Empire or started it. I don't know. No, you- I think I, I, at some point in college, either finished what was already out or kind of gave up. And I don't, I don't even, it was very long ago. You guys, I'm not that young (laughs) (laughs) well so okay um in freshman year was when uh netflix was still a dvd in the mail service but it also happened to have like a couple things that were like streamable also as like a why not throw in this sticker in your bag kind of situation Mm -hmm. and being like in the dorms freshman year with like some small amount of my own income i like was i got netflix and quickly was like forget dvds <laughs> i'm just gonna stream whatever <laughs> happens to be streamable and one of the things that happened to be streamable was legend of the seeker and uh. so <laughs> i started watching it and then i noticed in the opening credits that it said based on the books by terry goodkind and i was like i want to read that oh. and um <laughs> so then i just like went to a used bookstore because like school you know university campuses are surrounded by bookstores found mm-hmm. the mass market paperbacks and just like basically all through college is basically when i was reading these books so like Whenever I wasn't studying, whenever I wanted a break from, like, thinking and writing and school, I was reading sort of truth books. Okay, so this is interesting. You discovered the show first. Yeah. That's really interesting. I definitely found the show much later and didn't even know it was a thing, I think, when it was first coming out. The books, interestingly enough, I actually was introduced to them by – a guy I low-key had a crush on who was like 20-ish when I was 16. <laughs> Nothing really came of it. I mean, it, it, like, you know, we were in a community theater production together. Nothing really, nothing like came of it, but I had a crush was on him. Was it a production of Lolita? Books. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, 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 no. No, but, uh, but it, yeah, nothing, nothing came of it. But he was really into these books and I liked reading. So I was like, oh, maybe I'll read these books too so we can have something to talk about. And then I like got into the books. So I got my roommate into them. She only read, I think, the first three or maybe four of them. Mm-hmm. But we were kind of buddy. Like I didn't know buddy reads were a thing exactly. But like she no. was also reading them so we could kind of like laugh about them together. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like fun. Yeah, no, I... um I, I think my love of the books definitely lasted much longer than my crush on the person who introduced me to them. <laughs> so, yeah. So that was that was a positive thing. Because then you developed a that. crush on, on Richard Cipher and we're like, oh, that's, yes. that's a man right there. <laughs> I mean, look, I so I hadn't put it together until we started doing some of this rereading and talking through this. But I think that these books are probably the origins of my love of cinnamon roll heroes. For people who know me talking about romance, I love cinnamon roll heroes. And Richard is the most cinnamony of all cinnamon rolls. <laughs> but also Thor. But also Thor. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, he's cinnamon 100%. Thor. He is. And if anybody doesn't know, in romance genre terms, because probably people listening to this ne- don't necessarily all read romance, but in romance genre terms, a cinnamon roll hero is somebody who might look like big and tough on the outside, but is like ooey gooey sweet on the inside like a cinnamon roll, uh, which is 100% Richard. Yeah, he's, just, he's, he's so yeah. dumb. <laughs> he's so nice. And like, believes in rightness and goodness. <laughs> I feel like it's, but he's also like, I say, he's also Thor. So he's also like quite aggressive. He's blockheaded. Mm-hmm. He's stubborn. Yeah. He's a little dim. Oh, yeah. Like he's also extremely Thor. He he definitely is. And, uh, you know, which would give us perfect casting if somebody ever actually decided to make a good TV show of this. I mean, I straight up picture Thor when it, because even like later in the series when Richard gets decked out in kind of like a cool outfit that is like, you know, there's story reasons for the outfit, but his outfit is basically Thor's outfit. 
<laughs> you know, like it's literally Chris Hemsworth. Like, where yeah, are you basically. at HBO? Make this happen. <laughs> I mean, seriously. It, and okay, the other thing that I think is really striking to me, rereading the book, some of the books now, is he has such great female characters. I'm sure, as you can attest as well as a fantasy reader, the number of male fantasy authors who can write good, interesting, complex female characters is much smaller than I would like it to be. I honestly, I hadn't thought of this until I literally said it like, you know, five minutes ago. And now I've just been thinking about that more and more about the comparison Mm -hmm. to Witcher. Because like Witcher is filled with a bunch of female characters and they are very like sexy. (laughs) There's a lot of sex stuff. And then you have like grumpy Geralt, who's like, you know, this fighter dude who's like fighting for his own version of rightness. And there's like beasties and prophecies. And I'm like, um, Witcher is a lot like Sword of Truth. So y'all need to back the fuck up. <laughs> because like, yeah. you love Witcher, but Sword of Truth is very similar. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong. It, yeah. Well, yeah. And I mean, he also has like interesting female characters. But I love Caitlyn as like mm-hmm. a, as a strong. But I mean, also Yennefer and Caitlyn are not dissimilar. <laughs> Yeah, it would be interesting to look at the timing of what came out when and like whether there was any kind of influence. Okay, or this is just what was up. in the zeitgeist in the 90s. Like people were That into, is like, also entirely possible. Yes. Grumpy men with swords and like raven haired maidens <laughs> with light colored eyes being mysterious. <laughs> Apparently. Apparently. So this was definitely, a, I think, a, a big series for me in terms of. Some of my ideas, in in hindsight, I can see this. I think this was a big series for me in terms of my ideas about, like, relationships and sexuality, which is, I guess, good and bad. But I will say things that he does well in this book is he, like, prioritizes female pleasure as something that's important, which not all male fantasy writers do. Or really any. Just saying. <laughs> and you have powerful and you have powerful women who can like kick butt, rule countries, and you know, somebody like Richard who just like loves and wants to stand by and support the, the his his woman as she does said things, that's wonderful. Well, so I mean, and I think I said this to you, like, um, that oddly, I feel like if I didn't know, and if there there's certain things about it that, that read very much like a dude wrote this, but there's other things about it that I'm like, if I didn't know better, I would think a woman was writing these books because one, romance and love and true love and loyalty and that kind of thing are so mm-hmm. central to like every single one of the books. And then there's so many orchestrated opportunities for women to like, you know, speak up about women's right to have power and how like these villains are these like, alt-right-ish dudes who are like you know women shouldn't be in charge of anything ever and like what do you know you're just a woman and then having kaylin show up and be like i know everything there is to know about war i'm super powerful please sit down and be quiet (laughs) and there's so many moments that are like i've seen a lot of women write these like quote-unquote empowering soapboxing moments that like depending on who's writing it i can find it to be quite annoying when it's just like okay you just wanted to have a moment to soapbox but usually it's women writing in these moments for a woman to soapbox about women's rights and women's power. But Terry Goodkind is up here writing in as many moments as possible for women to be in charge of stuff and yeah. telling you about how they're in charge of stuff. Seriously. No, I love it. I mean, it, it is surprisingly progressive and feminist, especially for something written in the mid 90s by a dude. Like, I don't think he gets enough credit for how relatively feminist his books are. I mean, there are issues, like, don't get me wrong. There is the other thing I noticed reading Stone of Tears this time around is there is a lot of sexual assault, although towards men as well, but a lot more towards women. And there is a lot of that as a stand in for evil, which I don't love, but also was the 90s. And like the conversations we were having about these things were very different than what they are today. And again, I mean, we just read the second book, but like a large portion of the first book has arguably a lot more sexual violence towards men than towards yeah. women so i almost feel like this book was like balancing that out <laughs> be like yep. okay your turn ladies <laughs> yeah okay by the way i'm just saying it I, I, like because i was looking it up and i think the the witcher books like like look like they started getting written in the early 2000s so is that when they were being translated or is that when they were being written no the or, the original Polish editions were coming out like 2000, 2001. Hmm. 
is what it looks like. So, well, so presumably they're being written in the 90s and then published in the right. 2000s. But it's interesting, right? Because what if, what if <laughs> Sapkowski was a fan of Terry Goodkind? I feel like if this was a video instead of an audio thing, this is where you insert that gif of that guy from It's Always Sunny, like putting together the conspiracy <laughs> of like, Witcher is secretly a sort of truth fanfic. <laughs> <laughs> like it's like the the twilight 50 shades connection for fantasy mm-hmm. <laughs> oh man well it's also this is like not the author's fault but like i've been mm-hmm. thinking to myself ever since the witcher show came out that mm-hmm. like while you have these other prime time like premium cable fantasy shows like obviously game of thrones but you also have you know shows that are like uh, Penny Dreadful, or now most recently you have like the Luminaries and the Nevers, um, and Witcher mm-hmm. looks so like it's on like ABC at seven PM, which is where Legend of the uh. Seeker was, and like it looks about mm-hmm. like the same budget, the same like style, <laughs> and which is hilarious now that I've decided that they're the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. I actually really wish we would get a good adaptation of these books because I think they would be really great. And there's, you know, they're very sexy and very violent. HBO could totally take this on. I mean, you Definitely. have the the Mord Sith who are That's basically like, you could, like you could write a whole dissertation on the Mord Sith. <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah. I mean, you know, they're like iconic. And I'm sure there would be people who would be upset about it because it's it's definitely not the positioning that I think people who are actually part of the BDSM community would want representing them. So I don't know how they would handle that. But it's better than Fifty Shades. That true. (laughs) And it's also I mean, I guess I mean, the trappings of it is very BDSM, but in a universe, it isn't actually trying to say that it's the same thing as bdsm no it's not whereas 50 shades is trying to say that that is bdsm (laughs) right fair yes all true i just i just enjoy them so much too they are very very long books and but i kind of fly through them i i do too this is why and again there are people who are not going to like this comparison but i actually think like a good comparison to these books is Sarah J. Mass, which Terry Goodkind would be rolling in his grave. I'm sure. <laughs> well, so I was actually going to bring that up earlier and not so much to do with like the enjoyment that you get out of it, but like when you mm-hmm. intro it as like, this is the series that everyone loves to hate. Uh, mm. I was thinking to myself that like, because the comparison that you and I both talked about with Sarah J. Mass, but what's interesting mm-hmm. is that while a lot of people love to hate Sarah J. Mass, there's a ton of people that are like loyal, devoted, obsessed fans of Sarah J. Mass. Yeah. And I don't really see that side of things for Terry Goodkind. Like it's you and me, we're the fan club and like that's it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what's interesting though is I, I see people in the comments being like, oh my gosh, I love these books and no one ever talks about them. But there so... are no like mass hole equivalents in like the Terry Goodkind fandom like there just isn't yeah well maybe there were a couple decades ago but the internet wasn't the way that internet is no then. <laughs> that is true that is true which maybe we got lucky but well, okay yeah. so the comparison i want to make is i do think that what you said is true but the comparison i want to make with this is sarah j mass also writes books that are longer than they need to be partly mm-hmm. because of including a lot of kind of domestic scenes between characters like these kind of cozy moments and I love that I really enjoy it um in her books which again not the highest quality for fantasy romance but enjoyable to me if you like that writing style and similarly I think Terry Goodkind maybe they're not the most elaborate beautiful prose high fantasy but they are enjoyable and they do have these great characters and these cozy domestic scenes. He also though likes to soapbox, which Sarah J. Mass does not really do much of that. No, but uh, me being less of a fan of Sarah J. Mass, I would say that like what I think Terry Good kind excels at that like, I mean, I'm guessing you would disagree with this because you do like her books, but this is something that mm-hmm. I've never found in her books that I do find in his. And I think you do like it in his as well. Um, that like, because mm-hmm. we talked about his ability to kind of like uh, raise the stakes and make you really feel like the stakes are raised and make you feel mm-hmm. like this is like an epic moment and make you feel the tension of the moment. And I never feel yeah. that in Sarah J. Mass books. I feel like her world building is so like 
paper thin that I'm just like, I feel like you want this to be a big moment, but also none of this makes any sense. And I feel nothing. And I know everyone's going to live. So like, I don't care. Or Terry Good well, like the, uh, I know yeah. people are going to live. And yet I feel the tension of the moment because he just like, I don't know, he turns up to 11 in a way where I'm just like, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. To be fair, though, I think part of that has to do with the fact that they're kind of writing different subgenres. What Sarah J. Mass does well is fantasy romance. And so where you feel disagree. the feelings is, is in what? It's a disagree. <laughs> okay. 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 Well, in my opinion. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, I like I know that you... It, I, I understand why you don't like her. And there are other people who don't either. However, I would say the diff part of the reason is, is she's not really, and maybe she's trying to, but I just, it's not what I go to her books for, I guess. I don't go to her books for really amazing world building and lots of tension in the plot. I go to them for an enjoyable fantasy sort of set piece with characters I care about and relationship development that I find in, in like compelling. So I was say, but see, yeah. I find Kaylin and Richard's love story to be a lot mm -hmm. more romantic and romantically compelling than any of the romance <laughs> in Sarah J. Mass books. And then Sarah J. Mass also has, you know, like creature companions a lot that I always find extremely cringe. Whereas when I was reading <laughs> Terry Goodkind's books, I'm like, Gratch would hundred percent die for Gratch. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to have to agree to disagree, Leanna, <laughs> on Sarah J. Mass. It's okay. I understand. But uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, I that's the thing is like, I like the romantic subplots in these books too, but they're also not genre romance. Like they have good romantic subplots, but you know, like that's not, I, it's not, I wouldn't call it that as a genre, if that makes sense. I think the adventure piece of it with a strong romantic element is is a bigger thing. I do really like the way he raises stakes, though, because it's true. He, like, there are lots of gasp-worthy moments and twists in his I mean, books. there's I basically an apocalypse in every book, and I'm always yeah. super hyped for it. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, okay, so that element of it, if I was going to compare it to anything in more of a romance series, is it reminds me more of like the Psy Changeling series in Nalini Singh, where she is able to write high stakes and high tension where you're not sure how they're going to get out of it by the end, but you know they're going to, and somehow they do. It's mm -hmm. it's kind of similar to that. I haven't read those, so I can't comment, but I believe you. Well, maybe you need to read them because they're great books. <laughs> maybe. 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 They have good world building. I think you might be into they have murders, murder mysteries, you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I have a anyway. lot of first law books to be rereading. I don't have time for this. <laughs> <laughs> How many times have you reread re the first law books? I would like to plead the fifth. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I do need to continue with that series at some point. But yeah, I mean, but going back to like, I don't know, like, and we kind of talked about this as well about how it's slightly unusual with these sort of truth books that like they are more episodic in nature. Like usually when you mm -hmm. think of an epic fantasy series, you think of like, obviously there are certain parts of the plot that there, I mean, there's a story arc within the individual installment, but it's telling one grand story and kind of mm -hmm. moving you along in one grand story. But the sort of truth books are kind of like adventure of the week or apocalypse of the week. So like, yeah. there's like, the like the world ending thing the MacGuffin thing the magic thing that has to be figured out and it gets mm -hmm. figured out and then we leave off with some like riding off in the sunset but there's like you know basically like what's her name <laughs> Agatha from WandaVision kind of popping in from the corner being like uh-oh but there's a villain again so like yeah. stay tuned for next week when there's gonna be another problem <laughs> yep <laughs> no they are which I find really satisfying um and I mean part of it is the books are so long right it's like a thousand mm -hmm. pages so you're really it's it's like watching a season of television like that's kind mm -hmm. of what they're similar to yeah. yeah but then it also is like to read like I don't know I can I feel I mean I could I easily read like nine of these books which when I think about reading a fantasy series that more traditionally just is telling the same story spread out over nine books, that sounds exhausting mm -hmm. to me. Whereas yeah. like chewing through individual adventures across nine books, I feel a lot more <laughs> momentum with that because you have this like sense of like, oh, we saved the day. We did the thing. Achievement yeah. done. You know, book closed. We did it, guys. And then the next <laughs> yeah. one. Yeah, let's do that again. Versus like, yeah. oh, my God, we still haven't figured out like, who the we still haven't done is. Anything. It's book 10. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, no, it's totally it's it's very true. Where like it takes forever to actually get somewhere. Like it's it's very satisfying because things are moving along, things are happening, things are gonna it's getting resolved. Like it it is. It's kind of it's almost like marathoning a season of television to read one yeah. of these books, mm-hmm. and it, it's you know it's fun. It's not high art as much as good kind would love it to be but i just and i mean at the, the same character. time like if he didn't say that about it if he was just like you know writing some fantasy books like hope you like them then i would yeah. i mean there are moments certainly like with any good book that are poignant or thought provoking that say a thing mm-hmm. that makes you kind of go hmm um mm-hmm. and if that was as far as he was gonna say that this goes <laughs> i'd be like yeah you definitely have some stuff in there that kind of makes you go hmm like some of the wizard's mm-hmm. rules kind of i mm-hmm. actively think about them and i'm like hmm that's that's kind of true oh um, yeah. it's not like you know i'm living my life based on the philosophy i learned from the sort of truth books <laughs> yeah no i i think there is a lot of interesting things but i think that's exactly right it's like when you say that you're setting out to make your books this grand thing it's really easy for people to kind of poke poke fun at that and mm-hmm. it's unfortunate all these authors who you know if they had just kept their mouth shut looking at you jk rolling we were very <laughs> happy JK with rolling. the third boy like yep. why did you step in yep. why do you keep talking <laughs> just be quiet on twitter <laughs> yeah it's unfortunate okay but to be fair there are issues with these books as well and i think that one of the big things that kind of stood out to me and again published 1995 so keep that in mind but reading stone of tears this time around i was like oh thing that doesn't really hold up super well is the fact that you have these highly segregated male versus female forms of magic Mm -hmm. and the fact that like for somebody to be able to carry the opposite gender's magic they have to do like really horrific things yeah but then at the same time there was this kind of like i don't disagree that it's like it, it it didn't age well but there was also like this like glimmer of like what if it was written now how that would be different because there was this very openness to nevertheless like Mm -hmm. you know allowing the female to have the male power and the male to have the female power that Mm -hmm. there is a way to do this through great pain um so like arguably like transitioning is difficult and painful but it can be done you know what i mean like there's like that side of it where he's not saying it's impossible he's just saying it's you know like like it's, I mean, it's, i'm not saying I it's mean, like super pro anything but like it's not entirely like not it's not shutting down any I mean, conversation of fluidity Honestly, I think that might be being a little bit generous given the fact that like the great pain involves like letting a demon have sex with you (laughs) i I don't know i'm like "Uh." yeah you know with it with a barbed phallus no less i was like oh i forgot about this scene yeah i mean i mean that might be like giving good kind a little more credit than he actually deserves. I think it could be written in such a way. I don't know that he would have done that, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There is a lot of, uh, but the, the, the very vivid, intensely violent scenes throughout the books that I was like, oh, but you know what? A lot of it came back to me. The last time I had read this book was, I mean, Oh my gosh, how old am I? How long ago was this? Because I probably read this when I was like, what, 16 or 17? I'm almost 34. So it's been a long time. And a lot of things still came back to me really vividly. Yeah, I mean, I do in general, like, remember, like, especially as we've talked about them recently and been like, oh, yeah, how far did you get? And I'm like, how far did I get? And like, mm-hmm. when I hauled all the books and I was like, what was in this one? Oh, yeah, some super weird <laughs> stuff. Um, but like, I still remember, like, more than I feel like, I should than yeah. about these books but I feel like that was like kind of what we talked about where like it is like the purest like adventure escapism where like mm. that's why I was reading them in college because I could just like I completely forgot about my like crappy apartment and all my like deadlines and everything because I was just lost in a world where like magic and MacGuffins and an yep. adventure and I would just get sucked into it yeah yeah I was living the book for whenever I was reading it Yeah, they do. I mean, they bring you into this entirely different world, I think. And that was part of what I loved about it, too. These places really came to life and the characters feel very 
lived in. He does great character development. They all are, you know, <laughs> like they're they're complex and they're interesting. And even though Dark and Rawl is, you know, we've talked about this a little bit of a mustache twirling type villain, most of the baddies in this book are not that. Most of them are in 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 the series are pretty nuanced. There's and, a lot of shades of gray. Yeah. yeah, yeah, which I find appealing, and like that continues to be what I. Generally well, there's enjoy. also, I mean, yeah, aside from, you know, Dark and Raw, there's a lot of like what initially appears to be the antagonist ending up being your ally. Like a lot of low key yeah. type situations where like, yeah, initially, like this person was like doing something that you thought was against you or they thought that they should be doing something against you. But they ended up, you know, seeing like, you know, where you're coming from, you understood mm-hmm. what they were trying to do. And now you've like joined forces against Dark and Raw because everyone hates Dark and Raw. It's always yeah. Dark and Raw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, people who you don't like at the beginning end up growing on you. He, you know, he, he's very talented at some of what he's doing, especially with regards to characters. Yeah. I don't. I, yeah, I love the I, characters. I do, too. I don't know how many authors are writing characters that are this memorable. Well, and also, I mean, like, again, as I kind of alluded to, like, there's just so so many moments that like have me I'm already I'm already transported right I'm already like super invested Mm -hmm. and like escaping to this world but so many moments like in particular with Gratch but just in general where I'm just like (laughs) oh no and like oh that's so cute like oh no and like squealing and like giggling because like you know something good happened or something bad happened and giggling at the dumb jokes and the toasted Mm -hmm. toad truth and all these little like (laughs) isms that are like hilarious zed i love zed Zed so much he's the best wizard he's so funny he is the best wizard sorry gandalf Gandalf, i mean you know sorry gandalf yeah yeah i um okay so we should talk about gratch because he he's (laughs) that's all i want to talk about is gratch (laughs) (laughs) please do inform the people about gratch well, first, we have to address the fact that the naming conventions in this world are stupid and basic. <laughs> and like, I mean, I don't disbelieve that Terry Goodkind, like, I don't think it's a situation where like he wrote fantasy books and then after the fact was like, no, no, like this is actually meant to be an allegory. I think he always thought that was what he was doing. And I think that's part oh, of yeah. why the it's names are as basic as they are, because like he <laughs> yeah. didn't bother trying to come up with names for anything like the oh, mud man. people. Are you kidding me? <laughs> oh, <my gosh. laughs> and like the gars, like I finally put together the other day that they're called gars because G.A.R. is the first three. Like, it's the first syllable of gargoyle. And they are basically mm-hmm. gargoyles so that is what that is (laughs) you're like okay no creativity but um but the that's another like instance of your enemy becoming your friend where like richard Mm -hmm. fights off a gar and then realizes that there's this like little baby one that's like squealing by the carcass Mm -hmm. of the mother that richard just slew and the baby Mm -hmm. can't fend for itself and it like doesn't know what to do and then the other guards are going to come eat the little one. And Richard yeah. is like, no, I've got to save the baby. And then the of little course. one is like attached to Richard. And it's just <laughs> so cute. And so it's like, so... I mean, also repulsive and terrifying, but so cute. But so cute. <laughs> well, and then it's so heartbreaking because there's a scene where for its own good, he has to send Gratch away and he has to like yell at it and throw rocks at it to make it well, leave him. And like, it's like, so sad. When, um, when Arya makes Nymeria leave and she's like, no, mm-hmm. oh, it's the same, only way cuter. <laughs> you know what? Maybe George R.R. R. Martin is secretly a good kind of fan too. I mean, TVQH, it's like, I think any time, like in a book or a movie where someone has to like, I know, for its own good, like hurt an animal <laughs> companion and we all just yeah. die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, because, you know, we may as well start more conspiracy theories about oh, the fantasy absolutely. world. Every <laughs> fantasy author secretly aspires to be Terry Goodkind. This is a fact. Yes. Yes. Well, absolutely. okay. So I was going to mention this before. I was like, the mob <laughs> that the portion of the mob that refrained from coming for me will now come for me because, like, <laughs> I feel like. The enjoyment that I believe but do not personally experience, but I understand this is what people are getting out of the Stormlight Archive, this kind Mm -hmm. of like, it's a long, long book, but they don't care that it's long because they just love escaping into this world and love being Mm -hmm. around these characters that they love so much. And I'm like, I wish I felt that way because I wanted that and I do get that out of Dairy Good Guy's (laughs) books. So like, (laughs) when I picked up Stormlight, I wanted another magically transported escapism fantasy adventure and was mm-hmm. like nope this isn't it <laughs> back to rereading sort of true 
fun story. I am currently reading Way of Kings for the first time. Uh, how are you getting on with that? I mean, so far I'm enjoying it actually pretty well. I It's not the same type of experience as reading a sort of truth book, but I am enjoying it. I'm about 100 pages in so far, and uh, I think... It's just like 1%. <laughs> like 10 (laughs) percent but you know close enough um yeah I'm about 100 pages in so far and I'm I am liking it I'm finding it interesting the characters are interested are like you know not they're they're not iconic in the way that Richard and Kaylin are but they're interesting enough I think what I'm enjoying is some of the magic stuff that has similarities to science I think is interesting stuff of like reversing gravity and like I don't know I'm so I'm 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 enjoying it so far okay I'm very happy for you (laughs) thank you uh I would but no I would not call it escapist fantasy adventure fun like was it I mean like definitely I Not think at 100 it. pages in, you've barely gotten past the multiple prologues. So, like, the rest <laughs> of the 900 pages is going to be a lot of spending a lot of time with, like, a handful of characters. Where, like, again, if you're spending, for me, I can be spending mm-hmm. 900 pages with Richard and Gratch and be delighted. Mm-hmm. But, like, spending 900 pages with Kaladin and the bridge crew, I'm like, please kill me. So, like, <laughs> I get that people okay, are so loving Kaladin, this, but... Kaladin just joined the bridge crew where I'm at, so... Yeah, he's, that's gonna be... He's gonna... That's all he's gonna be doing for, like, 900 pages. <laughs> Exciting. <laughs> Yeah. We'll see. We'll see how I get on it with it. I mean, I'm not disliking it. I'm relatively enjoying it. I I certainly am not having the amount of fun as I had with Stone of Tears. These are my two giant fantasy books that I'm mm-hmm. reading this month. So yeah, that's ambitious. Um, it, yeah. But yeah, so basically I was I was kind of trying to throw a bone while also accepting that I will be like <laughs> crucified for this, but trying to be like, I get what people are saying when they say yeah. it's not about moving the plot forward. We just love spending time in this world. We just love being with these characters. And I'm like, I do not feel that way about that world. I do not feel mm-hmm. that way about those characters. But I feel that kind of feeling about a different mm-hmm. book series where like someone could say, hey, this book series makes no sense. The magic system is stupid. It's tropey AF. Like you're mm-hmm. like he's repeating himself. These characters are just like talking to each other all the time. Like we're just mm-hmm. here for too long. And I'd be like, you're not wrong, but I just live for it. So <laughs> <laughs> No, I think that makes sense. And and, and I think there's a lot of books that are like that. Honestly, that's probably kind of how I feel about some of Sarah J. Mass's books where I'm like, I hear the criticism and I'm like, yeah, I know, but I still enjoy them. So it's yeah. fine. Yeah. We like what we like sometimes, you know, not everything has to be objectively, I don't know, like meet I mean, some it, checklist. It would of really help standards. if Terry Good kind of hadn't gone on talking about how this, uh, these books are super yeah. deep. But like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is helpful. He is, you know, he is no longer with us. And so on some level, I feel like that helps a bit with this death of the author. (laughs) That's terrible because that like becomes literal. But um, with the death of the author You're saying you're glad that he died. (laughs) Okay. that's not what I'm trying to say. Oh my gosh. No. I think what what I'm saying is that with, I think with series like this, where there are issues with either the author or ideas and books or something if the author is no longer living you can kind of go in knowing what the books are who the author was what they said and they're not going to do anything new you know whereas somebody mm-hmm. like jk rowling right like we pick up the harry oh, potter series she is still uh, you know out there on twitter saying stuff that is like continuing to impact the experience of books that she wrote quite a long time ago and so I, I so I think that's what I'm trying to say is that with Terry Goodkind, you know, we kind of know who he was, but there there's n- not anything changing. But you know, something forward. that like I again, I don't know that I would have thought of this in these specific terms before now, and but I think that for this is true for you as well, and probably for many fans of Sword of Truth that like the the fandom really doesn't exist for it in the way that it exists for things like Brandon Sanderson's books or even, mm-hmm. you know, for Red Rising or for 
uh, most recently Robin Hobb. Like there just isn't mm-hmm. this kind of like community fandom reddits and like, you know, whatever discord servers where people are just like gushing over these books. It's just, mm-hmm. it's just not there. There aren't special editions of these books at all. It's really hard to find even hard covers of them. Like it just, it isn't, it doesn't have this kind of clustering community around it. And I yeah. feel like, and then combining that with the fact that when I first read these books, I certainly wasn't on any kind of like bookish platform. I was just reading books for myself for escaping, you know, the stress of college. So like my relationship with these books, it was then and remains to this day more personal and more like me and the book, just Mm one-on-one than almost any other books that I've read since then. Because like even books that I read before I started BookTube, I later discovered like Kingkiller, I just like picked up randomly and read on the bus. So it was an intimate experience for me then, but it is no mm-hmm. longer an intimate experience because now I talk so much about Kingkiller with other people. Whereas Sword mm-hmm. of Truth has always remained this thing that like I fondly remember as me and the book and like all of the mm-hmm. fun escapism of reading those books, just me and the book. <laughs> So are you saying that we're about to ruin all of that for you? No, I'm just saying that I feel like, I mean, <laughs> that fact that like, this is like the only time that I've really talked about these books is with you. Um, mm-hmm. That this isn't something that I constantly see in my feed where people are yeah. posting videos talking about it. Um, so even now it's quite intimate. Like I'm talking to like a friend that I've known for several years who also mm-hmm. read them like when, you know. <laughs> Many years were... ago. Yes. Yeah. Like this still yeah. feels very much like this like my roommate in college because she also read them at the same time as Mm -hmm. me so we could kind of talk about them but it's not like a massive fandom that I'm a member of that community it's just me in the book and like now also you in the book (laughs) (laughs) yeah no I think that's um it's definitely interesting because I I feel like there is a lot of fodder for conversation with these books and like there could be that kind of fandom that's going to pull it apart and talk about all the details because there is so much to talk about. No one wants to out themselves as a good kind fan. (laughs) I know. Well, we're, we're out and proud, I guess. That's some good kind fans. Oh, man. Yes, indeed. Well, and you know, maybe, maybe we'll, we'll get more people on board with us and try to push HBO to, (laughs) <laughs> to make a make a series <laughs> i think they would be good they would they would make for they make for good i do i mean obviously not that you know not every book is for every reader but i think a lot mm-hmm. of people if they like if they were able and not everyone is because i myself mm-hmm. know how difficult it is to forget what you know about an author i learned about what he mm-hmm. was like after i started reading the books but and by that Same. time i was in yeah. love with them so I don't, I don't even know if I'd be able to do that. Like if I knew what he was like, um, if I would have been able to pick up the books and not be like, well, that's soapboxing and that's soapboxing. So like, right. Um, but that's it. If someone is able to, I feel like people would be surprised if they picked them up to see like the books aren't as bad as they probably think they are. <laughs> <laughs> like they, no. they're pretty like, especially as compared to like other fantasy like mm-hmm. if you're reading Witcher books, if you're reading Wheel of Time books, like I'm, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, but like those books are not <laughs> that much better or yeah. at all better. <laughs> than the well, Witcher. and I mean, honestly, like these books are so much more accessible and readable than the Wheel of Time books. And I, I do mean, those books, I think, are, you know, the sort of truth books are an excellent starting point for adult fantasy. Like if you've never yeah. read adult fantasy before, this is so much easier to like get into and to like give you the confidence and courage to go on to read more adult fantasy yeah absolutely I think it's I mean I think it's a good gateway gateway to that I mean I guess for me it probably was this was probably one of the first adult fantasy series that I read yeah and look at us now (laughs) so so I didn't I hadn't read enough fantasy for me to be like these are just the most cliche tropes I've ever seen I was just like oh magic stuff yeah world yeah, well, it was no. fun. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, same. It was, it was very, it's, it's, they're fun. I mean, they're not, are they groundbreaking? No. If you want to read groundbreaking fantasy, go read like N.K. Jemisin. You know, I mean, like there, there are I mean, amazing fantasy authors out there who I also love and read. That's not what this is, but this is fun escapist. This is like what, you know, cozy mysteries or like, 
I was just saying, because we Har- already... Harlequin conv- category romances are to their genres. Like, this is kind of that fantasy. We already know? compared Richard to Thor. I mean, the appeal of these <laughs> books is not dissimilar from going to see Marvel movies. Like, the highest yeah. highs, the lowest lows, the cutest yeah. little friend moments. Like, it's a lot of mm-hmm. dumb stuff, a lot of cliche <gasps> stuff. It's a lot of, like, mm-hmm. weird posturing and adventuring and whatever. But, like... People love Marvel. (laughs) I love Marvel movies and some people don't. And if you don't love Marvel movies, maybe you also wouldn't like the sort of truth books. Yeah, but so like there's nothing wrong with with Marvel movies. They're not going to win Oscars, but they're also like a ton of fun. And there's a lot of like stuff to like talk about and to pick apart. But no, it's not going to be like, you know, this is not Dostoevsky (laughs) and it's not something that wins an Oscar. It is a Thor movie that you have a lot of fun (laughs) watching. Yes, exactly. I realize we never explicitly kind of said, we've talked about the fact that Good Kind does get on his soapbox occasionally in the books, but we haven't really explicitly talked about what. So for anybody wondering, he is he was very, very libertarian yeah. in his ideas. And but as, as me and yeah. Bethany also kind of talked about, like his brand <laughs> of libertarianism was oddly socialist at times yeah. <laughs> so yeah. like it's kind of tough to like if you didn't know anything about him which i didn't when i first read them it would yeah. be uh, there's times when you're you'd be like absolutely sure that this is coming from someone who's a libertarian and other times when you're like well but you also made a <laughs> fantasy un yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> um i'm not sure what your take is <laughs> because we have to protect the freedom of the small nations who don't have the power to protect themselves which again like i i don't know that ayn rand agrees with that um, yeah so for people who say that he's just constantly like very ayn randy about things sometimes yes Sweet. but also he's also very much for like standing up for the little guy that can't support yeah. himself so like that's a quite like you know like a, a charitable help those around Mm -hmm. you attitude that like yeah well and i think especially in a fantasy series it it all works pretty well and it's more you know well that i mean this is something i actually thought we were going to be talking about for the whole thing instead of whatever (laughs) we were talking about but like (laughs) as i kind of talked about in a video on my channel um Mm -hmm. that like it's and this kind of philosophy works very well in a fantasy setting where like it, it's easy to overlook it and not notice it because fantasies in general are very like pro monarchy and pro doing what is right and like getting the magic sword to take care of this by yourself because you're the hero and only you can do it. And that kind yeah. of like if that's your political philosophy, if that's how you think that America should be run. Well, no, <laughs> but like in a fantasy story, I like, have zero issues with this kind of thinking because right. like. That's literally what Lord of the Rings is like. So like, sure, why not? Yeah. Yep. Basically. I mean, I think that's, that's basically it is I think in summation, these books are not as bad as people say they are. They have a lot going for them and they deserve more credit, even if the author was a little out there, you know? He was a lot out there. He was a lot out there. He was, but it, you know. So are many fantasy authors. He is far from the only one. I was going to say, like, if we <laughs> also if we his author read... photos, like, oh my yeah, gosh. If we guys. didn't read any books by any author that was, like, a little strange, then we, would, we wouldn't have a whole lot of books to be reading. This is very true. Yes. Um, I, yeah, I think the only thing I knew about him when I started reading them was he had strange author photos. <laughs> Yeah, whenever I saw his picture on the back of the book, I was like, are you sure like, this guy wrote it? He doesn't look like the guy that wrote Richard. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> this man wrote about a fuzzy little baby gargoyle drooping its ears? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's very, like, tough, cool guy, like, trying to be cool. Photos, okay, whenever I saw that picture of him with funny. his, like, arms crossed and his hair slicked back, I just kept waiting mm-hmm. for him to just, like like finally break and like start laughing because he can't hold that serious face any longer <laughs> like it looks like he's <laughs> it looks like a joke yeah. it you know it reminded me of like the the villains from um like the three ninjas did you watch those movies or like karate three ninjas? Or something? okay three nope. ninjas was it came it came out like when some of the later karate kid movies were coming out and me and my brothers were very into it i got it was probably very niche but it was about these three siblings like brothers who train to become ninjas and fight bad guys who are anyway. It, it, I mean, that fits because what I've said multiple times is that Terry Goodkind looks like the villain from an eighties karate movie. So yes, it's yeah. The <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty much, <laughs> which is, it's, it's funny, but I, you know, the books, the books are pretty good. They're surprisingly progressive. 
they have great female characters. I wish more male fantasy authors would take a page from Goodkind's book in terms of how they write female characters. And also baby gargoyle characters. We need also more of baby that. gargoyle characters. <laughs> yes, I would take more of those as well because that was also adorable. Yeah, it it made and I finished it and I was like, that was fun. I want to read another one, but I can't because I have too many other things I need to read. <laughs> well, also like I because I do remember pretty like I, whenever I pick any one of them up, like I do remember the kind of overarching plot of each one, even if I don't remember a lot of the specifics. So like, I do remember what blood of the fold is about. And I'm just like, uh, I mean, you know, I definitely want to read it, but uh. <laughs> there was some weird stuff in that one. <laughs> I mean, there's some weird stuff in all of them. Exactly. Which is why honest. I'm like, no, I still want to read it. But like, also I remember specific weird things. <laughs> oh yeah. I, I just always remember like temple of the wind. Well, that's maximum weirdness. Like, yes. none of the books are as weird as Temple of the Wind. <laughs> I don't know why I kept reading after that one, because, like, at reading that one, I was just like, what is happening? <laughs> why is any of this happening? You just have to keep going. It all It's all about the prophecy. I, I, I have to say, I really enjoy all the prophecy stuff, that there's yeah. these, like, obscure prophecies that somehow get fulfilled by the end yeah. of the book, and it's like, how also is it going like, to be fulfilled? The like quote unquote theological debates that he has with Nathan or the prelate mm -hmm. whenever like prophet or with Warren anytime they're discussing prophecy and like I do mm -hmm. like that like I mean it's obviously a commentary on like scripture IRL and like people mm -hmm. how they interpret scripture and there's even a line in Stone of Tears where they're like um, well it was originally in High Taharan and if you don't read High Taharan you're just reading the translation of it now they're arguing over the meanings of the translation and that wasn't even the mm -hmm. real words and like even the original words is a is a transliteration of what is supposed to be a vision and how like how mm -hmm. could you be analyzing this when you don't even know the original like context right. of this and i'm like i know exactly like you're literally talking about how people argue theology when they have like an english yeah. translation of the bible like i know yep. that you're doing that but i think you're doing it pretty well yeah yeah <laughs> i think it's it's really interesting and i guess that yeah i i probably appreciated that when i was a teenager also yeah yeah okay well any uh kind of final thoughts or things you wanted to get out there in defense of the books um i don't in defense of them i don't know i just feel like <laughs> if people i guess i would say this like people who have not read them who just out of pocket like to shit on you for reading them i'm like mm -hmm. um if you've read them and you want to, I mean, I don't really think you should attack anybody for what they like to read, but if you want to make fun of them and say they're awful because you did read them and you think they're awful, well then like, you know, that's fair. You have that right. Go ahead. But if you're just doing it because you heard Terry Goodkind is kind of a joke, but you haven't actually read the books, um, maybe try the books. You might be surprised. Yeah. I, yep. I concur. Cool. Well, thank you. This has been a fun conversation. I'm glad we glad we decided to do this. Also, 10,000% would die for Gratch. Yes. Everybody <laughs> probably will, will feel similar. Yes. So go read them. Give them a try. You never know. You might find something unexpected that you enjoy. Again, this has been Chapter 3 Podcast, and I'm your host, Bethany. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd really appreciate it if you would go rate and review the podcast so we can continue to reach more listeners. You can follow us on Twitter at Chapter 3 Podcast. And uh, exciting news, we now have a YouTube channel available, so you can find this wherever you get your podcasts. But if you want to see it on YouTube, not see it, listen to it because it's still just audio. But we now have a YouTube channel, which is also linked in the show notes. The next episode will be available in two weeks, and this episode's bonus content is going to be available to patrons in the next few days. Thanks for listening.